places have joined us and um, I'll just ask uh, a couple of my co-hosts to confirm that they're hearing sound. You have joined us hopefully for the correct webinar and that is putting beavers to work for watershed resiliency and restoration which is um, to help us understand beavers as a natural infrastructure solution. This webinar is um, being hosted by Alberta Environment and Parks and um, is a uh, basically a repeat of a webinar we gave in January, which was hosted by the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment to look at natural infrastructure um, solutions across Canada. We will be recording the webinar, um, except for the Q&A session at the end, and um, we encourage you to use the chat box throughout um, to provide comments, but also to post questions so that we have them um, when we get to the end if something strikes your interest. So my name is Noreen Ambrose, and um, I'll be starting off the presentation today. I'll be co-speaking co with Holly Kynes, who is with the Mistakis Institute. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about our organizations and our collaborative throughout the webinar. But this webinar is, is part of a, a collaborative between our organizations. And we're really pleased to uh, share some of the information that we've been working on with you today. So cows and fish, you might say, well, why? or what has that got to do with beavers? Um, our organization's mandate is to help people understand what riparian areas are, their importance, and some of the options and alternatives for management um, around these areas. And beavers, of course, being a keystone species are very much in riparian and wetland habitats. And so it's really um, integral to our work of how, how do we uh, live and coexist with these places as well as this, um, this species. The Mistakis Institute, um, who Holly is with, um, is really about bringing together the, the science and the research and communicating it to decision makers um, to help promote healthy landscapes. So we want to start our uh, webinar off with a quick poll to understand a little bit more about you, our audience. And so I'd like to um, ask you to fill in um, the first poll, which is um, I'll just again to give you a big action. Back action. One, you have two questions, or one question rather, two choices. So just take a second um, and tell us if you've considered beavers as a natural infrastructure tool before today. Great. Great, it looks like uh, almost everybody has voted. So um, if you haven't, um, please hit yes or no, and I'm gonna close the polling. Great. So it looks like the majority of you um, certainly have um, been thinking about beavers as a natural infrastructure tool, but for some of you, it's also new. So um, thank you for that background. That's just to help us understand um, where you're coming from before the start of our presentation today. So our next uh, poll is just to understand a little bit more about what um, where you're coming from or, or what your role is in the work you do or why you attend or attending today. So if you could please uh, tell us, as soon as I launched the poll, uh, a little bit about um, yourself. So why uh, or who do you work with or why are you on the call today? So please click the one that best fits you. Great, and thank you. I'm gonna close the poll. Almost everybody has voted. It looks like there's no new additions. So um, it looks like we have um, a wide spectrum of people. Well, we know from some of the people that registered from across Canada that we would get people from all kinds of government, um, academic researchers, uh, the nonprofit sector looks like it's most represented, but also we've got folks from industry, landowners and others. So. Um, Great, and um, thank you again for just helping us understand who's listening today. So I'm gonna start off by talking a little bit about beaver natural history and their role in watersheds um, and ecosystem services. 
So we know that beavers are a real Canadian icon. Lots of places are named after them and they're on our nickel. Um, and, and they're just an important part of our identity. Beavers also are what drove, of course, the expansion and European settlement of the North American continent. The, basically the fashion industry, the desire to have uh, the beaver belt um, to help build hats was what led to uh, Europeans um, coming to North America. Um, of course, there were Indigenous peoples here before that time, but um, that rapid expansion led to um, beavers being used a lot for, of course, for, for fashion in Europe, but also um, over time in some areas um, over harvested and certainly in some areas um, extirpated, which um, has been in some cases leading to reintroductions, but also a growing recognition of the role that beavers play in the landscape as a whole. One of the challenges, of course, that um, people see with beavers is the impacts they cause and things like cutting down trees might seem wasteful or um, needless. But of course, if we understand how beavers behave and their sort of natural history, it can hopefully help us understand better how to coexist with them and gain the benefits while minimizing the, the um, negative consequences of beaver. And they do in a human built landscape and where there's lots of people and activities, there's going to be some conflict for sure. And, some of that is things like flooding crops and pastures and fields, uh, bridges being washed out or roads, um, culverts being plugged. This is the inside of a culvert, which um, was great for the beaver because it made a very nice defined small space that he could plug. Um, but that causes significant problems like flooding over roads. You can see in the picture here on the bottom right, the in the center of that picture is where the culvert is supposed to be letting water flow through, but um, clearly is not. And, and, and these kinds of infrastructure uh, implications of, you know, an ecosystem engineer um, can pose some real challenges for us. And our sort of conventional or typical way of dealing with those things was to get rid of the beavers or to get rid of their dams, whether from dynamite or um, trapping or shooting or, or removal. And um, the problem with that, of course, is that it does have some negative consequences as well, not only ecosystem damage, um, but we don't gain any of the benefits that beavers provide um, when we're trying to address the problems that they cause us. So what we want to talk today about is about some of those options and alternatives. So, you know, where do you stand? Good, bad, indifferent, the beaver? Um, perhaps it's neither of those things. It's just a beaver being a beaver, but causing um, some challenges for us as people that live in that same landscape and work and play. Beavers have been around a long time and evolved to be good at what they do. And part of that is, of course, their teeth, um, which are coated with a harder enamel on the outside, that orange layer, um, which is, you know, harder and doesn't erode as quickly or wear down as quickly as the soft layer behind, making them very sharp teeth that are very suited for cutting wood. And a, a beaver colony is um, successful over time by, you know, having multiple generations, typically a couple adults, a couple young of the year, and a couple of uh, two-year-olds. Um, they can have more kits, of course, and typically do, but they don't all obviously survive. When the spring freshet happens, that's typically when the, the teenagers, so to speak, are sent out um, to find their own territory. And, and beavers are territorial, although they will allow related members to set up a territory closer, um, non-related individuals, of course, have to find their own territory because um, they, they are, are distinctly territorial and don't like others in their space. They move in the spring to new places, but they also have to prepare for winter and that's caching of food. So in a pond um, that they've created or that's naturally existing, they have to store woody material by cutting down uh, trees and branches off of larger trees and uh, caching it. So partly submerged underwater, you have the stems. Um, so once the ice flows, of course, most of Canada freezes. So once there's ice, some of that stuff will be sticking above the ice, but a large important part of it will be below the ice in the water and will be accessible for beavers. So they have food throughout the winter and are safe from predators. The beaver's uh, home is sort of like a castle surrounded by a moat of water. Um, usually their lodge is surrounded entirely by water or at least partially by water if their lodge is um, on the shore, say of a, a wetland or a large river and um, they basically have a platform inside it that they spend their time once they're in it and, and they can swim in and out um, without getting out on land, obviously. 
Beavers, of course, need adequate water, but they also, um, if they're living in places that have uh, gradient or flow, um, they like very low gradient systems, wide valleys, and they need generally enough aspen or willow um, present to be successful and to persist for a very long time. You can see on the picture on the right how they like to build series or sequences of beaver dams, and that creates more habitat, more swimmable habitat and opens them up to more um, more places. So it creates more edge habitat, more of that transition zone. Um, and um, you can see in the picture on the right, the uh, in the foreground, there's a large beaver lodge in the center. And in the distance at the furthest big pond, there's another small lodge. So they can have multiple uh, lodges as well. Um, and that swimmable habitat, of course, creates more food opportunities, but also creates safety from predators. Now, in addition to needing enough just actual water, they can't have a lot of fluctuations. And certainly um, across uh, lots of Canada where you have frozen conditions uh, through the winter um, and drier conditions certain parts of the year, water fluctuation can be a real issue for beavers. So it can't be more than a meter and a half. Um, and winter drawdown um, generally can't be point, more than 0.7 meters because they might not be left with enough total water that's not frozen, as well as they may not be left with um, enough safe passage so their their entrances for instance to the lodge might become exposed and when they're not um, you know in their lodges they're busy cutting and eating and part of that is wood and and they can um, cut up to a, an aspen a day um, meaning a colony of beavers uh, needs quite a lot of aspen or um, other kinds of poplars and willows uh, to survive over the course of year, as much as uh, 0.4 of a hectare or an acre for every one to two and a half years, depending on tree size and colony size, of course. We do have this tendency to focus on the wood, trees and the shrubs that they eat, but they actually um, eat a lot of other stuff, particularly during the growing season. Wood is only a very small proportion of their diet in the summertime, as little as 16%. And that's because they'll be eating catbills and uh, bulrushes and pond lilies, duckweed, um, all kinds of other uh, broadleaf or forbs, um, as well as eating um, sometimes rather unusual things that might be beside their homes, such as crop fields and barley and things like that. But they, um, they typically um, focus on wood, of course, in the winter because that's the material that they would have cached. And sometimes they run out of wood. They run out of material and they sort of eat themselves out of house and home. Um, or perhaps they, um, you know, are eaten by predators or um, disease gets them and there's not any left. And if that happens, of course, their beaver uh, dams, which are shown on the left here, aren't main being maintained and, and eventually will um, unravel or fall apart. Um, and that's part of a natural pond cycle that, you know, because they do require a lot of woody material, if it's not regenerating quickly enough um, or for other reasons, they're not able to sustain a colony in an area, then of course um, they come and they go. But in the big scheme of things, beavers have been around for thousands of years. And after glaciers uh, left much of the continent, uh, we had these deep um, V-shaped valleys, like in picture one on the top left. And over time, beaver dams um, trapped a lot of material, um, soil that was filling up the bottom of the valley. So that by the time you get to picture four on the bottom right, you actually have built wide, broad U-shaped valleys, which have much deeper um, soil profiles and flatter um, situations. So this ability to be ecosystem engineers and trap material means that from a sort of human perspective, they're trapping a lot of sediment. Sediment that maybe would naturally run off, but also sediment that perhaps is coming off the landscape in increased levels due to human activities. And some interesting research shows that it can be from you know, 35 to 6,500 cubic meters of sediment in a pond, um, which is the equivalent of over 380 tandem dump trucks. That's a lot of soil. And of course, with that soil um, is material, um, typically suspended solids, nutrients, um, bacteria, things like phosphorus, nitrogen, and fecal coliforms are associated with soil particles. And by trapping those things downstream of each beaver pond will typically have cleaner water or better water quality. So um, pretty important, um, both from a nutrient perspective, but also some growing research showing that, that carbon is sequestered in beaver ponds. 
they're also being recognized as sort of a, a way of restoring streams. Some work by um, Dr. Joe Wheaton and his colleagues in the US, um, they're trying to basically mimic beaver dam. So beaver dam analogs are being built in streams that have been incised where the channel bottom itself has dropped and been eroded away, trying to reconnect to floodplains, reconnect to riparian areas and build back the natural meandering nature of, of our streams. And um, because these structures, of course, create that function of trapping and rebuilding. Because beavers need a lot of water, they're always looking for more ways to, um, to house it, I guess I would say, and build it. And um, in addition to um, excavating in front of their dams and around their lodges, they also excavate a lot of beaver canals or beaver runs. And I'm sure many people who've walked out in the outdoors around a wetland, or a lake, or even a stream edge sometimes um, have accidentally stepped into one of these a little over our heads. And um, this water storage is seemingly small, but they can be hundreds of meters long and they can be um, even a meter and a half deep, although not typically quite that deep, when you add up their cumulative effect, um, it contributes to the overall water storage, which is significant. And that surface area is important, but even more important is what's stored underground. And groundwater storage in, in beaver dam uh, systems is five to ten times the surface water that you see. So really like a, the tip of an iceberg, you, you see just a little bit above um, and the majority is, is down below. Because that extension is hundreds of meters sideways from the pond and you know three to six hundred meters downstream or downslope from a pond, there's a lot of storage capacity um, for again natural infrastructure. And there's again some interesting research that shows as much as nine percent of a watershed can be increased with open water and 30 percent 30 to 60 percent of the water in a watershed will be held in beaver ponds um, where beavers are present and so they are responsible for a significant amount of the surface water seen and also increasing downstream flow from them because two to ten times the flow um, may occur downstream of a, a beaver pond and dam complex and that's again because they've stored all that water they're not magically making more water they're just giving that opportunity um, for water to be held when there's lots and then continue to be released and in lots of North America and certainly most of Canada we don't have much rain or snow coming down that's turning into liquid during the winter but yet streams and rivers rely on flow all year round and so that stored water in shallow groundwater is really important to contain um, water that can then provide flow throughout the year. And those dams that store water also are like speed bumps. They slow water down, um, they delay it of course by holding it behind, and each small pond or big pond has the ability to hold a little bit of extra water probably at any given time. And the more of them you have, the more they can store a little bit extra each, which can help dampen flood uh, peaks. They aren't really effective at uh, dampening big floods, but um, they can take the peak off, flow off of um, off of flood events. So that um, is an important aspect of beaver dam roles. In addition to storing water and flowing water, they of course are creating more diverse, connected, and complex habitats, which means there's much more opportunity for diverse biodiversity. Lots of different kinds of physical features means more biological um, opportunities for different kinds of homes and habitats for life. And part of that water storage and release is also about changing the water temperature. Generally speaking, the water that's stored as shallow groundwater that comes back into the, the water body um, is cooler. And that cooler feature means that it's better for things like trout and salmon or other um, aquatic organisms that prefer the colder or cooler water. So what do beavers do? They do a lot. They affect the physical structure, they affect the quality and quantity of water and what's in it. That means they change nutrient cycling. They actually increase riparian area, they create wetlands, um, they influence the habitat and the water quality. And many of these things might be seen as you know benefits or, or pros, but some of these might be you know issues too. You don't necessarily always want more wetland habitat or uh, changes to it if that is causing say flooding or other kinds of infrastructure issues. Um, so it's about also trying to understand what happens and then how do we how do we coexist better. So because beaver ponds retain the water 
slow it down and detain it, store it and then release it. Um, they do provide lots of those sort of ecosystem engineering opportunities for us. So we do a whole bunch of education and outreach, this webinar, of course, being one, but we also have written some um, materials which are on our website, which I encourage you to check out. And we do offer a series of workshops um, called Beavers in Our Landscape, where we cover more in depth with the same kind of content we're talking about today um, with lots of local communities. So um, hopefully we'll have some opportunities and be invited to do that in, in, a, in your community locally. So I'm going to turn it over um, now to Holly to talk a little bit more about the collaborative itself, some of the other things we're doing beyond the ecosystem sort of ecology side and, um, and what the relationship is. So um, I'm going to turn off my screen sharing and over to you, Holly. Perfect. Thanks so much, Noreen. Uh, if someone could just let me know in the chat if you can all hear me well, and then I will start sharing my screen here in a second. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. There we go. You should all see my presentation now. Um, so thank you uh, to everyone for joining today. It was nice to see some familiar faces in the chat and welcome to all our new friends as well. My name is Holly Kinnis. I work for the Mustakis Institute and I'm a conservation analyst there. So our collaborative beaver project that we have with cows and fish started in 2012. Um, so we did a citizen science reintroduction uh, project at a conservation area in southern Alberta. Um, at the time of doing this, we started to realize the potential that beavers had to address all of our watershed, well, not all, but some of our watershed challenges. Um, and people soon after started to approach us saying, you know, we'd like to see these benefits on our landscape, um, how do we coexist with beavers in a way that it's a win-win situation for both parties. Um, so soon after we did a literature review um, and authored a report on the use of beavers for restoration in the United States. So the main goal of our uh, beaver project is essentially to encourage coexistence between humans and beavers. And we have this goal because we want to see beavers maintained on the landscape so that we can have the watershed resiliency and restoration benefits. And we do this by decreasing conflict, fostering social tolerance, and increasing the understanding um, about beavers and their benefits to our watershed. So now I want to loop us back into how exactly beavers are related to natural infrastructure. So here we have our beaver, our ecosystem engineer, um, our keystone species. Of course, beavers create beaver dams, which we would consider the actual natural infrastructure. Um, the beaver dams create wetlands, which is another um, feature of a natural infrastructure. And that leads us to the ecological function that wetlands have, which, is, which we're focusing on here is wetlands or water storage. Uh, but of course they have other ecological functions and benefits as well. So that water storage leads to our ecosystem service, which is our flood and drought mitigation and the other various benefits. And then that ultimately leaves, leads to our enhanced climate resiliency, our ultimate outcome. So how exactly is our project putting beavers to work for watershed resiliency? So I want to go back um, to 2016. So uh, one of the pieces of our project was actually doing an Alberta-wide survey to determine um, Albertans' level of knowledge and their perceptions around beaver habitat and uh, beaver management in Alberta. So as you can see in the map here, we had a pretty broad distribution across the province uh, from our survey respondents. So I'm just going to quickly skim over these for you. Um, there's, of course, more information on our website, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the top five findings from our survey uh, was number one, there is support for coexistence with beavers in Alberta. Because at the time of doing the survey, we were questioning, you know, what's our level of coexistence like? What is our social tolerance for beavers? Do people want to coexist with them? And we found that, yes, in fact, they do. Um, so our second finding was that there is a clear need to address damage caused by beavers, uh, which Noreen has mentioned before, like tree felling, flooding of roads and trails, um, various other challenges. 
Um, our third finding was that benefits are being realized, but there is a need for more information regarding the benefits afforded by beavers. So uh, people often picked up on um, the aesthetic benefits of having the wetlands there and creating habitat. Um, but what a lot of people were, may not have been as intimately aware of were the watershed um, storage capacity, the groundwater recharge, and some of those other uh, benefits. So our fourth finding was that there is a need for better understanding of the roles and responsibilities around beaver management. And of course, these vary um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And then our fifth finding was that there is a desire for more enhanced education on the ecology of beavers, um, including their impacts on fish species and habitat and coexistence methods. So those were two of the topics that people were most interested to learn more about. So the outcome of our survey results really helped us refine a lot of the topics that we cover um, for ongoing work that we've been doing with our collaborative, which include um, webinars like this one, uh, in-person workshops, and symposiums as well. And uh, we've created a variety of targeted awareness materials, which we were able to refine as a result of the survey. So I'm just going to quickly go over some of these awareness materials um, today. So um, we've created a fact sheet series. So these are two fact sheets in the series, um, one on beaver coexistence tools, the other one on beavers and fish. Um, and I just want to point out a, key, a few key features of the beavers and fish fact sheet. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions around the relationship between beavers and fish. Um, they've evolved together for millions of years. Um, beavers encourage permanent flows, as Noreen talked about. Uh, their ponds can be a thermal refuge for fish. And they do not, um, their dams are not a barrier to native fish species movement. Uh, so another uh, part of our awareness material uh, are some, the creation of some videos here. So on the left, you'll see two videos um, that are, are talking to landowners saying, you know, why do you coexist? Why do you think it's important? Um, you know, that sort of thing. And then on the right hand side, we have some installation videos. So for bo both a pond leveler, as well as um, a culvert protector exclusion fence that we've installed here in Alberta. Um, another thing that we like to point out is that we have developed a collaborative website between Mustakis and Cows and Fish, so you can find it here. Um, the website is at the top and we'll have it at the presentation at the end as well. Um, so this is a wealth of resources. So some of the resources we've created ourselves, like the awareness materials I just showed you, um, some of them are presentations from previous symposiums. Um, so those are all housed on our, our website. And speaking of the symposiums, um, this is another role that our collaborative plays, uh, and that is sharing knowledge between a community of practice. So there's a lot of people doing uh, great beaver projects, beaver research out there, um, you know, municipalities trying to manage their conflicts that have a lot of lessons learned to share. So we like to bring these people together so that they can all learn from each other. So um, in fall of 2019, we hosted um, our second uh, symposium. We had 70 people attend and we had presentations from across Western Canada and the United States, um, as well as a film screening. So as part of that symposium, we also did a field trip. Um, and you can see, I'll just go back here for a second. So we're looking at a culvert protector here. Um, and the person pointing to it, some of you may know him, Adrian Nelson of Humane Solutions. Um, he's an expert in the field of installing a lot of these tools and he's helped us um, lead some train the trainer workshops. So this is one of the culvert protectors that he has installed. Uh, so after the symposium, we asked people to uh, complete an evaluation and the attendees said that they had increased their knowledge on beaver ecology and management and that 87% of them were interested in attending another beaver symposium in the future. So the, sympo the symposium is um, one of the facets that we like to look at in our creation of a community of practice. So like I said, we have our website. Um, on our website, you can sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already done so. I know a lot of you um, have found out about this webinar from our mailing list, but essentially um, it's a place where we like to share a lot of the knowledge that we've been learning and a lot of the new research or other webinar opportunities that other groups are doing as well. Um, we also do this via social media outreach um, and both Nastakis and Cows and Fish, uh, we respond to requests that a lot of people 
have about questions regarding beavers and their coexistence, um, and we can get people together on those topics. Um, and right now we are working on a, a knowledge transfer template, we're calling it, so that we can track some of the lessons learned um, around some of the coexistence tools that are out there so we can share, share lessons learned together between all the practitioners. So I want to look at a few case studies today. So I'm gonna start um, outside of Alberta, outside of Canada, and look at the United States. So this is a case study from uh, Eastern Washington in the United States. So in 2006, a bill was passed that was calling for 3.7 billion cubic meters of water storage to be added. Um, so I'm gonna go with uh, metric in speaking, but you can of course see the imperial conversion on the slide here as well. Um, so from this, the Beaver Solution was created. Uh, so Beaver Solutions first phase was to develop water storage estimates and identify suitable beaver habitat in Washington. Uh, so what they actually found was that each beaver dam has a potential to store 22 to 43,000 cubic meters of water. Um, and then they did a stream assessment for the habitat there. So they found that um, you can see the stream miles here. Um, so for all those stream miles, when they did their calculations, they actually found that if beaver were to be in place of those streams that had habitat to support them, they could actually increase their water storage in that area by 2.5 to 5 billion cubic meters, which is incredibly impressive. Um, so as a result of this, in 2012, um, the beaver bill was passed. And it's great because this beaver bill actually allows nuisance beavers, so beavers um, that are in an area that are creating a challenge that you know the landowner um, can't address the challenge, uh, that sort of thing. So these nuisance beavers were actually able to be live trapped and relocated to a suitable reintroduction site to allow for that enhanced water storage. And um, we'll be posting this presentation after, like we said, we're recording it. So we'll be posting it to our Beaver website. So you'll be able to get um, all these links as well. So if you wanna find out more information on the Beaver solution, here are some links and an informative little video too. So now I wanna take us back to Canada. Uh, so we're actually looking in Bellevue, Ontario at this case study. Um, so what they did there was that they were having some conflict with beavers uh, and the beavers were being lethally trapped out of the area, as is the case in a lot of municipalities. Um, so uh, a group of citizens, concerned citizens in the area, um, wanted to make a difference here and not see the beavers trapped and yet keep the beavers on the landscape for their watershed resiliency. So, um, the, the city actually produced a municipal wildlife coexistence policy. They previously had not uh, created a policy like this, but what this allows for them to do is first they will mit try to mitigate the conflict um, by considering alternatives to killing uh, such as pond levelers. So this was a very big success for this municipality. The second case study that I want to talk about today um, is in Port Moody, British Columbia, the other side of Canada from Ontario. Um, so they also developed a municipal beaver management plan. So this was um, a great success for them as well. Um, same sort of situation, they were having conflicts with beavers. Um, some of the beavers were uh, being trapped and there were, there were some issues around the trapping. And so what they did was they worked together with stakeholders to create this beaver management plan, which um, promotes coexistence and outlines best, best practices while still addressing a lot of the risks and liabilities that are associated with uh, living with beavers, essentially, um, as well as the human, and health, uh, human health and safety aspects of it as well. So um, the nice thing about their plan as well is that it addresses compliance with all provincial and federal regulations um, relating to wildlife and also fish passage, because as we know in BC, um, they have a lot of imperiled fish species which leads us to our next case study. Isn't this nice how they all flow together? Um, so we want to um, show this case study because it's kind of an interesting case here. So this is the fish lift. Um, it was installed after the management plan was developed in Port Moody. Um, it was installed by, I spoke with him before, Adrian Nelson of Humane Solutions. Um, so although there is no evidence of fish passage is issues with pond levelers, um, they wanted to be sure that they address these concerns for sure. So 
um, Adrian Nelson developed this uh, pond leveler fish ladder combination device essentially, uh, which was installed to mitigate flooding that they had in the area, but it also acts as a fish ladder um, so that their imperiled fish species, such as um, the salmon species there, and then you'll see the cutthroat trout has been using it, um, can more easily and readily use this to get past the dam while still flooding um, is main, maintained at a level that doesn't flood infrastructure. And of course, we have a little video um, on our website, or well, on their website um, that you can find of how uh, they actually have a video of the fish using the ladder from in the water, which is pretty neat to look at. And now I will pass it back to Noreen, who is going to go over some Alberta case studies. Just bear with us here. It just takes a few minutes. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I think I, I need to refresh my location. My apologies on that. Hang on a second. And just a reminder, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll answer them in the question and answer period at the end to the best of our ability. My apologies, hopefully that's correct. Um, sometimes Zoom thinks it's smarter than, than we are, and maybe it is. So I wanted to um, take over from Holly now, and thank you, Holly, for giving us all that background of lots of great things happening across, uh, across the continent. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few Alberta case studies, things we've been um, either directly involved in or learning from, and, um, and just share some of those examples with you. So part of the work we're doing as Holly mentioned is we're trying to create a community of practice and that's really about understanding how to coexist better. What are some of the tools and the techniques? Alberta is, I would say, certainly ahead of some provinces in Canada, but we're a long ways behind many other jurisdictions in North America in terms of applying these techniques and learning about them. And there's nothing like learning better than a demonstration site to try things out and get people familiar with touching and feeling and and managing these kinds of sites. So we've been doing a series of demonstration sites to train practitioners to implement these kinds of techniques and also monitoring the riparian health over time. So um, Holly mentioned the Cross Conservation Area project uh, a little bit earlier and that was a reintroduction project um, which in Alberta is, is a challenge. There's uh, a number of regulatory limitations that allow reintroduction but the folks at the Cross Conservation Area were able to um, get the permitting required and, and do some reintroduction. So it was a good opportunity to learn about weaving together that with pond levelers um, and with citizen science. And so um, that's been an ongoing learning opportunity. Another one of the sort of on the ground projects, which uh, you saw some pictures of in what Holly talked about was the uh, demonstration at uh, Foothills County, formerly the MD of Foothills. And they basically had a situation where you can see in the middle of two culverts um, that were old and not allowing water to flow basically. They were collapsed um, and there was plugging at the other end of course which the beavers were happily contributing to um, which was leading to the flooding of the road and you can see on the bottom right hand picture here how there's um, a gravel county road and essentially um, until it got fixed uh, they, they had regular plugging um, and flooding over this road and so the folks who needed to drive past that point uh, couldn't get to their own yards or out of their yards because of the water. And so they um, spent a lot of time working with the local community trying to find a solution that was cost effective, but also that made all of the parties involved and that were affected um, happy. And, um, and so you can see basically a T um, sort of add on to a normal type of culvert and that you basically dig out underneath to make it deep enough so it's not easy for the beavers to plug it. And there's a grate or a grill on uh, both ends of the T um, that's in the water and above the water so that again the, the, the beavers can't readily plug it in. Although it was a relatively expensive solution for a one-time activity because they'd had major infrastructure challenges with this uh, site, uh, they needed something that was permanent and would continue to work and, and it certainly has been successful since it was installed. 
and um, this is uh, again a link to the video that you can listen to some of the I think the social side of the challenges not just the sort of the practical side of the how to build things but also some of the challenges with um, you know you have diverse people with diverse interests and preferences um, so really I encourage you to watch that video later the other thing that that sort of demonstration site led us to learn along with some other sites is that beavers are quite happy to be fed and they can be bribed and uh, don't necessarily have to cut their own trees down. And so um, near that site, um, Tierra Boldu, who um, is a landowner that um, really likes the beavers and values the benefits they provide, um, worked with uh, Foothills County to actually um, get permission to cut the trees and the shrubs that were coming up in the ditches, um, which normally the county would have to do for road safety. They can't have the trees encroaching on the county road, obviously. Um, he instead cut them down and um, basically took them to the edge of the pond and, and fed them to the beavers. And he's continuing to do that quite successfully. And the beavers basically don't bother to cut around, cut down the trees and shrubs that are around the pond because they really don't need to. The other interesting thing that uh, Pierre has been um, playing around with and others have as well is using a recorded um, device basically a tape player with um, a recording of running water and um, encouraging beavers to build additional dams upstream um, for some of the neighbors there who also want more water storage on their places and um, so that's a pretty interesting technique beavers respond to the sound of running water and don't like it so they're trying to get rid of that sound and so they bury the tape recorder in this case or um, build dams where, where they're trying to remove those sounds the other um, thing that Pierre found by having beavers near his place, because his home is right adjacent to the pond, is that his um, well, which is a personal water well for their household, um, had maintained and increased its height. So it's um, deeper, basically, or, or more volume of water and higher consistent flow. So that's uh, another benefit that he found. We've also um, been learning from some work being done in Beaver County, very aptly named, who have had lots of human beaver conflicts and began working with the University of Alberta a number of years ago to try and be adaptive and figure out, you know, how do we address some of these regular problems, things like beaver tunneling through um, access or trails and roads, um, things like beavers plugging culverts. Um, in this case, these are culverts under roads. If the culvert is full of water and, and plugged up at the other end, it freezes and causes, you know, issues during the winter because of the ice. It's, of course, plugged up and doesn't flow. It can cause overflow or damage to the roads. And like many municipalities, they use the typical, you know, removal techniques, bringing in big equipment or um, beaver, you know, trapping or shooting, um, all kinds of things to, again, deal with the problems caused. And so they wanted to come up with some longer term solutions that might also be cost effective. And so they began looking at pond levelers, which we've mentioned. The idea being that you basically put a pipe through a beaver dam at a height that you are okay with the water being at. So the, the water will drain to that, that height. Um, the beavers can't get into the end of the pipe because you put a, a cage around it and the water flows um, out and reduces the overall height of the water, and, and unless it's shallower, in which case it doesn't keep flowing. Um, so that's kind of the, the super simplified version of what it looks like. And they started installing them um, in 2013, I believe, but they installed a bunch of them in sites that they wanted the water to remain and they wanted the beaver dam and the beavers to remain, but not quite so much water, not so deep. And so you can see the full project results on the county's website, but um, this is just a picture they've provided and we thank them for sharing this, these learnings of the, the pond leveler installed and the water flowing under. And you can see the water level reduced from before and after. They also um, worked with researchers from the University of Alberta who had um, some economic um, expertise. And um, Dr. Glynis Hood and her colleagues uh, basically started tracking the costs of the installations um, as well as the prior costs. And then they did a bunch of uh, net benefit analysis. And the analysis without including wetland valuation benefits was that over three years with 14 of these pond leveler devices, there was a net benefit of $64,000. When you add in the valuation of of wetlands, which of course do many um, ecological um, goods and services and, and provide many benefits. The benefit was over $380,000. And so 
you know, the, the economic case, I think, is there in a cost benefit um, process. They also found that the average cost of installation, which includes the materials, the labor, the transportation, is only about $1,000. They're, they're very inexpensive. Um, and, you know, that their, their maintenance and monitoring is also very, very low because they're super simple kinds of um, devices. So they also did some analysis of some sites that were not just on county land, but in the provincial recreation area land of 12 devices, also over a three year period. And of the 12 devices, um, it cost them, um, you can see at the bottom there, 16,500 approximately to, um, that's to put them in and the monitoring and maintenance of them over that three year period. In comparison to the average annual park management expenses um, of, of the non-device areas. So they, they were much, much cheaper um, to do pond levelers than the, than the traditional go out and unplug it with heavy equipment or uh, lots of labor um, because you have to keep redoing it. The, the goal hopefully with a pond leveler is that it will actually um, you know, be relatively maintenance free and you won't have to keep redoing it um, except for minor, you know, minor maintenance opportunities. The average cost um, of maintenance per year is also really low, $128 per site per year, which is certainly more, um, a lot, lot less than the very much more expensive hauling big equipment out um, and repeat visiting a site in rural areas over and over throughout a year. The other interesting thing that they did was they asked a bunch of municipalities to um, provide input on like how much do they spend on these kinds of beaver management, all kinds of different options and alternatives. And you can see that shooting and trapping are still by far and away the, the most um, used in terms of um, what's happening across a bunch of Alberta municipalities and parks districts. Uh, flow devices, which is towards the top there, was um, a relatively small um, percentage of municipalities were making use of those, or at least of those that responded. And so combined, the costs that these um, jurisdictions reported was over $3 million um, in beaver dam removal um, and repairs and maintenance that people are doing for damaged infrastructure. And over 70% of the jurisdictions indicated that they overexpend their budget on an annual basis because it's always costing more than they think. And so if we can find cost effective methods to replace the sort of traditional or typical conventional approaches, we could save a lot of money um, for taxpayers or um, jurisdictions of all kinds. And it's partly about doing things in a, in a way that's appropriate or correct. Not all kinds of approaches and devices are effective. This is a a fence that's meant to keep beavers out. Uh, it's not very effective in the current situation because you can see the, the mud is piling up in front of the culvert um, and could pile up all over the outside of the fence as well because of the structure. So the key is to build a, a trapezoidal approach and, and for those of you that have worked in other jurisdictions you may have seen these across different parts of North America. In the picture, <clears throat> excuse me, you have Adrian Waller who's been working with us for a number of years helping us build them um, and the key again is to build the right shape so that um, it's hard for beavers to dam against them and they're also sturdy and withstand um, some debris which is natural in a flowing system as well as ice flows um, when ice breakup happens. And so this is a site in the city of Calgary in an urban setting in a, in a park pathway that was regularly plugged in the culvert which um, was one of our early demonstrations we worked with that had like this one been repeat visits required to keep unplugging it. So another site in the Foothills uh, County um, that we mentioned before, uh, below a really steep county road, the, um, they had to bring heavy equipment in where the before picture is and get on that little bit of flat ground that's right beside the culvert and try and use heavy equipment to get in there. It's a steep road bridge, it was dangerous, it was hard to access, they had to do it multiple times a year because it would get plugged. Um, and so putting in this combination device, which is an exclusion type fence and a pond leveler to ensure flow, um, has been really quite successful. It has required virtually no maintenance, just a quick check. And, um, and it's been, you know, very cost effective, obviously, compared to hauling out heavy equipment um, and trying to safely use it. Similarly, in that those sites are south of Calgary in southern Alberta, um, going further north, um, outside of Edmonton. This is working with Lac St. Anne uh, at an exclusion demo again to keep beavers out. You can see that on the top left the beavers had 
plugged the culvert with lots of uh, mud um, and somebody it had been hand trenched to just let a little bit of water through but um, that grate that was against the culvert isn't doing much good in fact it helps hold up some of the material and provides a platform to build upon so as part of uh, working with them um, and one of our demonstration training sessions was again to install an exclusion fence that would keep the beavers away um, that would withstand um, flood and uh, ice and, um, and give people an opportunity to try things out and so this site um, ha has succeeded it's, it hasn't been in for a lot of years but you can see it continues to survive through winter and it is also flowing the water does move through the culvert in the winter um, because there's nothing plugging it so that's an important part is you have to keep the material from building up against it which the beavers would do if they could and then also working in Laxanian County, we put in a pond leveler. This is a really long convoluted beaver dam that kept growing and kept increasing the water level and was flooding a road. You can see the bridge in the top uh, right corner of this second picture just popped up. The water was getting deeper and deeper and, and of course pushing up against the road verge. And um, so a pond leveler was needed. And this is a, a good example of sizing appropriately. This is a huge pond. It was over nine feet deep under um, to, between the um, pipe and the bridge. Um, so lots of water there and um, and we were able to reduce the water sufficiently. Um, it does, you know, need, potentially need to be sized appropriately. Every pond is going to be different. And we also are working with landowners. So those were county or municipal, rural municipalities and urban municipalities. Landowners are also finding ways to salute work with these kinds of solutions. So on the bottom left is a picture with a fence line where one of the landowners on the one side on the left wants the water from that flooded area because it's what he can pump out and, and water his cows with. Compared to the landowner whose land is on the right and it's flooding his cropland. Um, so they basically are working together and, and hopefully, hopefully this year um, a pond leveler will be installed that will reduce the height but allow enough water to be kept um, to, um, to meet the needs of the landowner who's using it for livestock watering. And also landowners are really quite ingenious and also recognize that sometimes they can do a modified version of, of something more complicated that's only going to need to be temporary. In the top right picture there that shows a bit of a pipe and a cage, this landowner just installs several small pond leveling type devices that he's figured out himself while the flooding is in fact affecting his wintering sites for his livestock and once he's not using his wintering sites um, it really doesn't matter if there's water there so again just trying to reduce the flooding impacts in a short term to make it um, coexistence possible and the other thing is i think there's a lot of excitement in alberta right now about pond levelers and exclusion fencing and they are great tools but of course they don't work everywhere and they also aren't always successful 100% in the way we might plan them. Normally speaking, we don't cage the bottom or downstream side of the pipe. You can see um, in the bottom right picture, there's a pipe hiding in there that the beavers overnight plugged after it was installed um, and therefore it is preventing basically water from coming out of it. And so the next day you had to go in and clean it out and cage it. And then you just see the beginning of the cage being um, started on the larger picture there. So they're not maintenance free and they're not perfect, but um, they also have to be applied in the right kind of places. Um, this is a situation where we helped install one in a more of a prairie setting and you can see there's not a lot of trees and shrubs, but there was a need for a pond leveler because there was a, a bit of a flooding situation again near County um, Road. Um, unfortunately, after the installation uh, about a year or two later, um, the beavers disappeared probably because there wasn't enough trees and shrubs, not enough uh, woody material to survive. And, um, and of course, then the pond leveler you know, fails, um, which in this case was unfortunate because they built interpretive um, signage and other stuff near them. And so they've uh, been looking at some other alternatives to, to still encourage the value of beavers in this place. It's also about like looking at all kinds of tools. How do we find places that we can just let beavers be, such as these bottom two pictures? Maybe it doesn't matter if there's flooding in some places um, or providing opportunities for habitat quality and that you know, isn't just good for beavers, but it's good for ecosystem health on the whole and, and managing accordingly and, um, and recognizing that coexistence is actually an option in some places without really doing much um, specific except allowing them to be. The other thing we have, I think, as a 
human nature is our tendency to just see things today or in a small scale in a short time frame and not recognize that um, if we look at it on the bigger picture you know maybe it's not an issue it's a problem if the bee reads all of our trees but really he's not eating the trees in the whole watershed he's just eating what he needs or his family needs and so um, if we can look at it on a bigger picture and longer time scale that can be helpful and this is an example here of uh, where there was a beaver dam and a pond behind it which had captured lots of sediment and for some reason the the dam blew out and was no longer maintained there was no more beavers and um and it looks like a mess but if we give it a bit of time it grows back in that's just sort of the natural cycle of nature um of natural healing and natural processes and evolution that that are to be expected in a, in these kinds of landscapes and um i think sometimes we forget to give things time and space. And also, um, it's really important to think like a watershed to work with neighbors, to work with partners, because beavers um, are part of our waterways, uh, water, our water systems and are interconnected and just like we are. And so our management choices and our coexistence opportunities and learning also need to be interconnected since beavers do move. So um, with that, I'd like to ask you one final poll question. And then we're going to um, shortly move into some Q&A. So if you could tell us, have you learned new information that you will share with others or that you're going to use to implement beaver coexistence as a result of this webinar? And I'll just give you another 10 or 20 seconds, if you could click your choice, that'd be great. Good, it looks like uh, probably everybody that um, was able or wanted to vote has pretty much voted. So um, I'm just gonna, <laughs> and I see the numbers are creeping up. I'm gonna end the polling now, thank you. Uh, almost everybody voted. And um, so I want to just uh, show you that uh, certainly it looks like looks like a large percentage of you definitely feel that this is going to help you in the work you do or in your coexistence with beavers. So uh, that's great news. Uh, nobody said no, which is also good news. And um, some of you need some time to think about how you might use it, obviously. So we hope you'll keep learning as well. So um, we will just um, move on to the last couple slides. And I want to really thank um, Alberta Environment and Parks, which is part of the Alberta government for the Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Program grant funding that's supporting this work, along with the Calgary Foundation grant funding we have. So uh, thank you very much for them for um, sponsoring and hosting the webinar to Alberta Environment and Parks and um, for those grant funding sources. And all of our partners that have been mentioned throughout um, this presentation as well, who work with us to make this possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Holly in just a second. Um, we are going to do some questions. So if you haven't already, feel free to type your questions in the queue in the chat box. If you want to contact us, please look us up um, and contact us um, about anything. You can look up our materials at the rockies.ca beavers website. If you put be putting beavers to work in Google, you'll get to it pretty quick. And um, our contact information is there. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly. Hello everyone, um, we're just trying to figure out how to share my video so you can actually uh, see my face if you would like. In this time of social distancing, it's kind of nice to see um, everyone's faces. So I am sharing my video now. Um, You're good. Not sure we if you can see, see it, but um, we do have a lot of questions here, so I'm going to get started. Um, 